All right, we're going to get started. Could we all stand and salute the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Thank you. Please remain standing for a second. Um, so my name is Walter Sanchez. As you, as you can see, Vinny, the chairman, is not here. I'm the first vice chair, so I'll be running the meeting tonight. I'd like us to have a moment of silence for a longtime community board member who passed away. Kathy Sumsky passed away this last month, and I'd just like a moment of silence for her. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, so it's 7.31. We're going to get started now. We have a couple of presentations. Again, I want to say that in the public speaking role, if, you, if you're interested in speaking, uh, you could speak for three minutes, but you have to put down your name, your address, your telephone number, your email address, and what the subject is, because we need to be able to get a hold of you. And it's going to be made public. So if the press needs to get a hold of you, if we need to get a hold of you, that's what it's there for. All right, we're good with that? Yes. Thank you. All right, the first thing we have is a presentation by the New York City Department of Sanitation, Joseph Ottominelli, Community Affairs. Change in times when refuse should be put out for collection. What's up, Joe? How are you? Hi, good evening, everybody. So my name is Joe Ottominelli. I'm with the Department of Sanitation's Community Affairs Bureau. I'm here tonight to discuss the upcoming set-out time changes taking effect on April the 1st. Uh, I'm sure, as everybody may know, the current set-out times uh, for placing out any uh, trash, compost, or recyclable materials is after 4 p.m. Uh, the changes taking effect on April the 1st are made with the intentions of reducing the amount of time. Trash is uh, laying idle on the sidewalk and ultimately, in turn, the uh, amount of rodents and, and, and uh, rats that these uh, items attract. So uh, for residential establishments, any trash placed out, any trash, recyclables, or compost placed out in a container of uh, 55 gallons or less with a secured lid can, uh, as of April 1st, will be able to be doing so after 6 p.m. Any uh, recyclable trash or compost placed out after, uh, in, in bags may be done so after 8 p.m. Um, for commercial establishments, any uh, trash, recyclables, or compost materials that the businesses generate uh, as of April the 1st will be able to be uh, discarded within an hour, oh, placed out for collection within an hour of closing uh, and, and, and in a container. And uh, like residential establishments, any uh, trash, recyclables, or compost that businesses place out for collection uh, could be done so uh, after 8 p.m. Uh, those, so those are the main points of uh, emphasis that we wanted to uh, relay to everybody uh, at the meeting tonight. Um, and if there are any particular questions or concerns, I'd be happy to uh, open that up now. So the commercial, does commercial trash have to be covered? That's it? Uh, for commercial establishments, though, they have two options. So if they place their items out in, uh, if they put, place their uh, items out for collection in a container, uh, they can do so within an hour of closing their, their uh, establishment. And if it's in bags, uh, they can do this, follow the same procedures for like a residential establishment, place it out after 8 p.m. Yes. Go ahead. What's your question? You can ask it. I'm all for you know mitigating the road problem, but I think it would make more sense to require all baskets to be covered up because if you just have bags and they're not allowed to move them out to like seven o'clock by the curb, before that they're alongside the apartment house open. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's just a matter of like twenty feet. They're still you know accessible to the rodents. So unless they're in rodent-proof containers, I don't think it's going to really make a difference. And we, we are encouraging the use of, of rat-resistant bins to, uh, in turn, uh, pair with this notion of reducing the amount of uh, rodents that this trash is attracting. So uh, if, as long as uh, those, those, uh, those bins are in compliance with, with uh, collection guidelines, that, that is something that the, the business can look into to utilizing. For yeah, you might put I mean, if you have a bag near the apartment house or in the curb, it doesn't matter. The rats are still going to get into it. And when do we start doing the compost uh, recycling? So, oh, so the composting uh, actually is going to be resuming the week of uh, March 27th, uh, and it'll be uh, resuming for str straight through. There will not be a pause in service uh, going forward. And an additional point that we wanted to let everybody know about, uh, for anybody, you know, for the support and, and participation we received in the program throughout Queens, we'll be hosting a uh, number of uh, compost uh, give-backs events throughout the, throughout the borough. 
for anybody who may seek uh, to, to retrieve a bag of compost. Because I think that's the best way to get rid of the rats, because if you just have garbage with no food in it, no animals are going to break into it. It's only the food that they're after. Uh, of course, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Ted. Yes. Hi. Yeah, um, uh, Ted Renz from the Myrtle Avenue Business Improvement District. How are you? So, uh, hi. So we're aware of this of, of this program, and we're in the process of we've already circulated to all of our stakeholders that we have emails for, and, I've, and this is going to be a severe burden on many small businesses because most businesses on a typical commercial trip like Myrtle Avenue close at say six, seven o'clock. Some of the chain stores and some stores are open, uh, and, uh, a number of them are open till eight, and it won't be an issue for them. But for some of the smaller businesses, uh, this is gonna be a burden. And every program that sanitation unveils has always had a grace period, a period of, of transition to give the new law uh, at the effect that, it, that you want it to have. This is not the case here. Come April 1st, summonsing immediately. No grace period. Another issue which I don't think you looked at is if all these businesses have to buy a bin or get a bin from their carter, you're going to have a supply issue. And you're going to start summonsing people right away for not having their garbage out in a container. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is an issue that your department is aware of because the Bid Managers Association and every bid has already probably conveyed this to you and I'm just mimicking that sentiment. So, uh, and one question I had, a, a, a merchant called me. He puts out, the corrugated um, cardboard is of course tied up in the manner uh, by law. He asked if they put it out uh, before uh, six o'clock, would he get a summons for that? Because he, the, he, the store closes at eight, and the people that take care of this, he'd have to have extra workers on to do this. Uh, and I was referred to uh, uh, Nick uh, Van Eck, who's mm -hmm. from your, by M Marissa from yes. the Community Marshall Affairs, Lace. and I'm waiting for an answer, because there, there should be some flexibility is what I'm saying. Yeah. And we'll see what happens. I mean, uh, this is, I understand why you're doing it, but uh, I think there should be a grace period. And uh, as I said, uh, that's my opinion. Of course, I, I could, uh, per that particular concern though, uh, Mr. Renz, uh, I can coordinate with uh, Nick to see for, you know, follow up on that so you can have some clarity well, on I, that. I yeah. sent an email and okay. he owes me a call, so I'm waiting for a call oh, from him. Excellent. Joe, Thank how you. do we get a hold of you? Uh, I'm going to leave my uh, contact information with, with uh, you and with then you can distribute here? it as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. Go. All right, good. Thank okay. you. Joe, thank you very much. Of course, thank you very much. Good luck with the project. Thank you. Uh, hold on, we have another question. Oh. We don't have enough people Hi, sir. to summon Hi, sir. How are you? Don't worry about it. How, How are you doing? Sir? Patrick Truncasey. So what are the fines for residential, uh, residential houses putting out uh, containers without covers? And what do you mean by a covered container? What, what are the specifications? Uh, so the, the, I'd have to, I could provide you my contact information to follow up on the particular uh, numbers on, on, on uh, fines. But uh, containers, we're just talking about a, a, a lid so the, the uh, bins aren't uh, uh, the, the trash in the bins isn't left uh, empty, uh, open, open for uh, access. So is the Department of Sanitation going to take on the responsibility of returning those lids to the covers? Because I've, I've given up on replacing lids. Yeah. No, I, I understand that that's been an issue in the past, and we can bring that back to see something that we can do internally for managing that particular concern, sir. All right, thank yeah. you. More questions? You yes. Yes, Peg. I would be more impressed with your initiative about not having the trash out too long if it wasn't for the fact that the recycling sits all day and half the night before it's picked up, even the next day. So you're putting out an initiative to co co control the rats, but you're not following through by collecting the stuff that's put out in a timely manner. 
Yeah. yeah. So uh, with recycling and, and collection related issues missed, there's a number of lo logistical reasons why we have uh, some delays on that particular front. But again, we are, you know, enacting this particular program to ultimately improve the eyesores that we see across the city, not just in Queens, across all the rest of the four, uh, four boroughs. And, and we're hoping that that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh. A, a very simple solution for the garbage can lids. Tire string has got to be long enough, though, because if it's too short, it interferes with the sanitation men putting the garbage in the truck. But I just put a hole in the container, put a string through, tie a knot on each side, do the same thing with the bottom of the container, and I never lost a lid since then. Plus, I have my address on both the lid and the pail. Yes. Yeah, you speak loud. Thank you. Um, I was just kind of following up on what Peggy was saying about the, the pickup. Uh, my question was going to be, does this mean the pickup is, is later than it used to be? Uh, yeah, so the so pickup uh, uh, pick times are remaining consistent with what they, they've okay. been pr uh, prior to this uh, change. Okay, statement. and is there any way, just to, out of curiosity, to get those times? Because the recycling does, it seems they've been picking up like the following evening, and it would just make more sense personally to actually put it out. Uh, yeah, the, what times are you alluding to, sir? Sorry. Just to, to pick up the actual pickup times, is there any way to find out when they're supposed to be? Because yeah, like, so it would make uh, more it, sense it, to put ours out in the morning, actually, it, it, than the night any, before. All, all of it is supposed to be uh, any, any trash for recyclables, anything with this particular uh, initiative taking place. Everything's supposed to be placed out by midnight for, for collection. Now, again, I can't speak to what, when, when, what shifts particular uh, uh, routes will be serviced, but uh, you know, I, we, I, it, everything is anticipated to be, uh, everything is supposed to be placed out by midnight for sh collection on that following day. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Paul. So that's, that's fine of what is being talked about, but let's, let's talk a minute about holiday weeks. So what happens on holiday weeks, it's different. Holiday weeks is that the department, you don't put the garbage out until the following, the, during the day of the holiday. Mm -hmm. Let's say you, you pick up as Monday and Thursday. So what happens on Monday when you normally would put your pail out, you don't put it out f uh, sat Sunday night. You're going to put it out Monday, but you're going to put it out by 4 p.m., of that holiday because sanitation could send a truck from their 4 p.m. shift anytime through midnight to make that pickup. So if you wait until the following day after the holiday, you're going to miss your pickup. So you got to watch that. So we can note that, sir, too. You're going to be here for a little while? I'll, I'll be here a little while. Yeah. Right. If anybody, anybody else on the board has any questions for him, he's going to be over here. Perfect. Just talk to him. That's yes, what's great about you. these meetings. You could do that. <laughs> thank you again, everybody. Thank Appreciate you. It. Um, yeah. Dolores Bachman, are you out there? Where are you? Say again. She's not here, but she no, left her sick. Great. Okay. Next presentation is by the Queens Public Library, Miss Merrill Agish community coordinator about the Queen's Memory Project. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for giving me some time to talk about the Queen's Memory Project. So we are the Queen's Public Library's local history program. We have about a 1,000 oral histories in our collection, and we invite people to participate in all kinds of archiving activities, digitization. We have scanning stations at every location. But I wanted specifically to share some news about the Name Explorer project, which we launched in October, and have been trying to get the word out. And um, what it is is a imagine Google map. I was hoping to have slides, so apologies, but that will be distributed tomorrow. Um, Imagine a Google map, but rather than, you know, locals, restaurants, things like that, each place is a name place in your neighborhood. So if it's a street co-naming or a school, a park, a monument, and so on, bridges, things like that, we have about 1,300 places that we've cataloged so far in the borough from city and state and other data sources. And we're asking people who know many of the locals who are being honored in these ways to share their memories of the people so that we can have a resource that really reflects the depth of information that people have 
And we know that so many of the locals may not be well known outside of their immediate neighborhood and their community. So I have uh, postcards for distribution. You can scan the QR code. It opens the map right up, and you can kind of toggle around and see around your neighborhood what are the street you know, names and things like that, for instance. Um, and we have a selfie campaign for Women's History Month. You can take a selfie at any place connected to a woman who's being honored in Queens and be eligible to win a lovely map. Um, and also, we are running a community cookbook series at the Ridgewood Library that's open to anyone with a connection to Ridgewood. You do not need to be just a resident. You do not need to only attend the Ridgewood Libraries programs. Um, we have monthly sessions online on Zoom. The next one is actually tomorrow at 3 p.m. on the topic of memories, uh, memories of recipes that you try to recreate and either succeed or fail at, depending. We've heard the whole gamut of stories around that. Um, and then I'll be in person at the Ridgewood Library every month. The next program in person will be next Wednesday, um, the 15th from 12 to 2. And the following month, I'll be there on Saturday, April 1st. So it's more accessible to people who may not be able to join during the day. Um, I have more information. You have there? I, have, I have postcards. I have my card. So Excellent. I'll hang around for a few more minutes, too, if anyone would like to talk. Um, if you have photos, if you know, yes, my friend is honored on a local street, and I would love to tell you about his or her story. That's exactly the type of thing that we like to collect, and we invite you um, to be part of this map. So thank you. Thank you. If you would, leave some information up there also, because sure. we find that after you leave, some people say, where'd you go? Can we get some? So leave a few things up here Sure, as well. I have a Thanks, whole stack. Carol. I'm happy Great. to leave it all. Thank you. Um, Carol Benevic Bradley, Friends of the Ridgewood Public Library, is going to be talking about the programs and events at Ridgewood Library. Hello. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, neighbors. I'm here to talk more about the library. Um, so I'm a volunteer with Friends of Ridgewood Public Library, um, and I wanted to share some of the upcoming events and programming that the library is hosting for our community. All of these programming, all of these programs are listed on the library's website, um, which is queenslibrary.org, and there's calendars available in person at the library. The Friends of Ridgewood Public Library also maintains an Instagram account where we share news about upcoming events. Um, and that account is Friends of Ridgewood Public Library underscore QNS. That's quilt night silent QNS on Instagram. And of course, the library is located at 2012 Madison Street. So here's some of what's coming up in March. Uh, animals Alive is offering kids the opportunity to observe and handle live animals to help them understand different kinds of animal classifications, such as mammals, birds, reptiles, and more. And that's on Monday, March 13th at 3 p.m. Uh, for Women's History Month, there's a fun vision board party to help you visualize your goals for the year uh, through a creative collage. Um, and that's on March 16th at 6.30 p.m. And then there's a Sounds of Spring classical uh, music concert, um, and that will feature songs from Fiddler on the Roof on March 18th at 3 p.m. And then there will be a mixed media workshop to learn more about the formal properties of mixed media. No experience necessary. Uh, and that's on, ooh, that's on March 22nd at 1 p.m. There's also a five-part toddler learning center series where specialists will be at the library to talk about early child development and practice by doing. Um, it's a five-part series, but the first part already passed. Um, so the next ones are on March 10th, 17th, 24th, 31st at 11 a.m. in the auditorium. And then uh, there's Stories for Rebel Girls, which is a musical adaptation of the book Stories for Rebel Girls. Um, and that's featuring music from Broadway accordionist and singer Mary Spencer. That's on Monday, March 27th. Um, and last but not least, Friends of Richwood Public Library is always looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can head to queenslibrary.org forward slash support forward slash friends dash of dash library. Or um, it's easier <laughs> if you can email friends at queenslibrary.org. 
uh, thank you, and I hope to see you all at the library. Thank you. Do you have a, a newsletter that goes out? Do you put all those dates in a newsletter? Uh, we do have an email newsletter. So Can if you, are we on your list here at the community board? Yes, I be believe great? so. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you very thanks. much. Okay, the next public speaker is going to be uh, Paul Kersner. We ask you to speak for two minutes. We're going to time you. I learned today he's on this board 50 years. 50 years. Before many of you were born. Okay, so my reason for speaking tonight, Louis Rodriguez, who is my neighbor in Ridgewood, gave all of you a map of Ridgewood and Glendale. And I want to explain this to you because it's important for you to have this map for several reasons. First, you should know what part of Ridgewood, which of 2,982 buildings, are part of the federal and state historic district. And what is also part of the New York City district. We are one of the 10th largest historic districts in the country, which is pretty nice. Um, it took, we began this work in 1983 when I was 23 and now I'm 72, and we're not finished yet. Teddy and I have some, a little more work to do on our commercial streets for landmarking. But the reason for giving this to you tonight is that we need the community board to get the two districts that are in red, number two and number 11, that's along the county line. Those two districts, those two areas along the county line have not gotten their city designation. They have their federal and state, but not the city. And so what we need is an effort to be made not only by the community board, but by everybody from Ridgewood and Glendale to send a letter to our two council people, Jennifer Gutierrez, in whose district She's these two red areas are, and Bob Holden, who is in the rest of Ridgewood and Glendale. And in essence, we want them to send a letter to the city council, or rather, yeah, from the city council, from them to the city council and to the mayor to get city landmarking in uh, 2 and 11. And the other districts that are not marked yet, they have to get New York City landmarks. And so if you're in Glendale, we need your city councilman, who is Bob Holden, to write to the mayor to do that also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirchner. Congratulations on your 50 years. And we have a statement um, from Dolores Bachman, Glendale resident, 772164 Place, on the B13 in Brooklyn Bus Network redesign. I'll read it. Yep. Yeah, this uh, lady is uh, 88 years old, and uh, she writes, my name is Dolores Bachman, I'm a resident of Liberty Park, and even though I'm 88 years old, <clears throat> I am an active bus rider. If you live in Liberty Park and you want to go to Wyckoff Heights Hospital, uh, the Ridgewood Library, Fresh Pond Road, Forest Avenue, or Wyckoff Avenue train stations, you need the B13 bus. If you want to go to Jamaica Avenue, Franklin K Lane, or Gateway Mall, you need the B13 bus. Now the Transit Authority wants to eliminate the B13 service along Cooper Avenue. Residents of Liberty Park, a section of Glendale, south of Cooper, uh, who are accustomed to use this bus will now have to walk down to Myrtle Avenue. This is a hardship for the many senior citizens and handicapped people who live in my neighborhood, not to mention an inconvenience in bad weather. Perhaps someone from the Transit Authority would like to walk from 80th Avenue to Myrtle Avenue in the rain, the summer heat, or the winter cold. Maybe they can make enough money to be able to afford a $10 or $20 cab ride rather than a $2.75 bus fare or a senior fare of $1.35. And don't tell me to ride a bike. I'm 88. And my senior neighbors are not going to be riding bikes either. But without reliable bus service, how are we going to be able to shop, to visit doctors, 
go to Wyckoff Heights Hospital for tests, visit friends, go to church or the library, connect with further transit for longer trips, or do any of the multitude of things that we rely on the B-13 for. In addition, we hear that the TA is planning to stop service on the Q39 bus south of uh, Myrtle Avenue. These two actions will deprive a large area of public transit options. Not only Liberty Park, but all of Glendale from Cypress Hill Street to Cypress Avenue, from 80th Avenue to Myrtle Avenue will be a transit desert. Queens already has enough transit deserts. Why create another one? This plan may look good on paper, but the TA has not considered the welfare of the people who will be affected by their plan. The Transit Authority must rethink their options and provide safe, affordable, and better bus service for our neighborhood. And that's from Dolores Bachman. Thank you. Okay, I think that the B13 bus issue should probably be referred to the committee. Oh, the committee has okay. already commented okay. with regard to the matter. Great. Because now they're doing the Brooklyn bus network. Uh, we'll cover the B30, the Q39, when we're dealing with the Queen bus. Okay. So we have to. Uh, uh, the last meeting's minutes. We have to. We have to review the last meeting's minutes, and I'd like to. Uh, any questions on those minutes, and can we accept them? Yes. Motion to accept. Motion to accept. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Any Any opposed? Great. Katarina. Okay, we're going to go over uh, alcoholic beverages locally and also building demolitions notices. You have them? All right, I'll read them. Gas Gas, New York, NYC, 5936 Myrtle Avenue. Their new liquor license, that's in Ridgewood. Cochina, Mama Rosa, 689 Seneca Avenue, Ridgewood, New York. Brisa de El Huna Corp, which is at 913 Wyckoff Avenue in Ridgewood, and those three are new liquor licenses. Liquor license renewals. We got the Kiras Kermes Inc. 6636 Fresh Pond Road, Ridgewood. The Ridgewood Ale House. This again, this is renewals. 5738 Myrtle Avenue, Ridgewood. B and B Express Bar 6607 Fresh Pond Road. Minder Binder Enterprises LLC Miller's Yard 564 Seneca. That's a liquor license renewals, and this is new wine and beer and cider. Euro Twist. Moo Moo Foods, 6054 Fresh Pond Road. And Wine and Beer Cider Renewals, Zenith Thai Inc., 70-02 Fresh Pond Road in Ridgewood. Uh, and that's it. Any questions on any of them? Any concerns about any of those establishments? No? How do we find out what they do as a business? The top one has a temporary re retail permit. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Or a seeking one. I was just curious. Also seeking a temporary re retail permit. That's the top one. The first two. One and two. Right. Go ahead. John. So the temporary retail permit is a way I believe the SLA is getting over a backlog of about six months. So if somebody files for a temporary retail, they can start serving alcohol sooner while they're going through the process for their full license. Sorry, I thought it was like selling That's okay. That's good. All right, and demolition, nothing on demolition. Okay. Um, now we're going to have, we have representatives here. We have uh, oh, members of the press that are here. Elijah Hamilton, where are you? From the Times News Weekly, he's right over there. 
and Arena Shukerhan Shuk, um, from the uh, Queens Ledger and the Glendale Register. Raise your hand down there. It's back there. So if you have any questions, they are here. Thank you for coming. All right, now we've got Daniel Lewis from the Queensboro President's Office. Daniel, come on up. Hi, my name is Daniel Lewis. I'm really representing the Queensboro President's Office on behalf of Community Board 5. I will be sharing some events that we have coming up for, with our office. Um, so we have the State of the Borough on Friday, April 28th at 10 a.m. We would like to have you guys there as well. You can RSVP on queensboroep.org. We'll be having an annual Bangladesh Independence Day celebration on Thursday, March 16th, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Helen Marshall. That's at Queensboro Hall, which you guys are all invited as well. We have the Meet the Staff on Tuesday, March 14, which will be virtual and Zoom, and we'll be having our Women's Health Fair on Thursday, March 21st, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Helen Marshall at Queensboro Hall as well. And we'll be having our Vasaki celebration on Tuesday, April 11th, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Helen Marshall as well. All of these events that we have upcoming are also on our website, and you guys can also RSVP. So our State Art Bureau is April 28th, 10 a.m. at Queens Museum Theater as well. Thank you. And the date is April, April 8th or April? April 28th. For the uh, state of the borough? Yes. Okay. And you guys are all invited to RSVP. So we're just really show up? <laughs> just RSVP okay. on the website. You got Thank it. you. Thank you. Jonathan Bentoncourt, representing Nidia Velasquez, Congressperson. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Betancourt. I'm here on behalf of Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez, who extends her greetings, and would like to thank all you guys for your public service. On behalf of the Congresswoman, I just want to briefly share um, some highlights of what she's currently doing in Washington, D.C. Yesterday, she introduced the Landlord Accountability Act, which is a bill that would amend the Fair Housing Act to ban discrimination against tenants who have rental uh, vouchers. What the bill also does is it would fine property owners $100,000 every month that they're found to deliberately warehouse an apartment. And what I mean by that is if they deliberately keep an apartment from the housing stock, they would be fined $100,000. Also, did you guys know that um, in our district, two e-bikes powered by IM batteries exploded in the last month? And it damaged two homes and placed a tenant in critical care. It's a big issue. I know we've all been, we've all seen on the news. We've all know that it's going on here in New York City. Mm -hmm. And that is why the Congresswoman sent a letter to the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission urging them to crack down on these batteries. And it's not only a matter of protecting ourselves, it's a matter of protecting our properties as well. The Congresswoman also joined members, other members of Congress in calling for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to reform Medicare Advantage. We find that Medicare Advantage is financially injurious to our seniors, our disabled, and our retirees. Mm -hmm. Lastly, the Congresswoman wrote a letter to the United States Assistant Attorney General in regards to the case United States versus Genesee and Wyoming Railroad Services. She expressed her satisfaction with the decision of the case in which the railroad company must upgrade its locomotive fleet to comply with the Clean Air Act pollution control requirements, destroy ADA outdated locomotives, as well as pay a $1.35 million civil penalty. It is estimated that the railroad company will pay $42 million to comply with these requirements. In the letter, the Congresswoman urged the Assistant Attorney General to fully exercise their authority and ensure that the implementation of this decision is swift and responsible. Uh, we want to thank all the members of this community board for working very hard on that issue. And we, we know there's more work to be done, and we look forward to working with you guys in the future on this issue. Lastly, the appropriations process has now begun. Unlike the last few years, there are more restrictions on what the Congresswoman is able to submit for community funding. 
For example, we are no longer able to request funding for facilities and equipment for local health care clinics, behavioral health services, violence prevention and food assistance, after school programs, post secondary programs for college students, job training programs, anything to do with education, we cannot submit any of them. And that's just to name a few. On our website, you can find our office's internal deadlines for your submission. Many of the deadlines are coming up in the next few weeks. They gave us literally two to three weeks to submit everything. Uh, so if you're looking for community funding, look, go on our website. I encourage you to reach out to the office if you have any questions regarding that. Uh, so I thank you. I'd like to thank you all for your time and allowing me to update you on what the Congresswoman has been doing. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Yes, sir, I have a question. Hold on. Of course. Uh, as far as warehousing apartments, what right. buildings would that apply to starting at what size building? Uh, I believe it has to be more than a five-unit building. And it would have to have um, tenants who already receive federal rental assistance vouchers, so Section 8, and other rental vouchers. Go ahead. I, know, I thought it was two different things. You spoke about vouchers. You spoke about vouchers, and then you spoke about warehousing apartments. Yeah. Some would, you, some would you choose to leave an apartment both in their building in, in their building vacant? But so that starts only above. Yeah. So it's not targeting people who own homes and rent to to anyone. It's it's landlords who own a building that's five units or up. It might be six. I'm sorry, I don't have the bill in front of me. Five or six units up, and they already have if they already have a tenant that receives a, a voucher, a rental voucher. Okay. Uh, you can find the bill online on congress.gov if you'd like to take a look at it. I'll take a look, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Any question, yes. Yes, about the uh, e-bikes. Um, yeah. Something that maybe the congresswoman could help us. So she's been working all for the past couple of weeks with the local, we've been working in Glenda with the local precinct and the fire department. We have a, about 20 or 30 electric bikes being stored and used uh, in the back of a private home, which happens to abut a elementary school. And because there's a lock and it's private, where the police can't go in. Right, right. So we're at a loss at what, we're got, what we can do. I've called the buildings department, the fire department, the police department. I've got lists, and as of today, what we've been trying to do and what they have been trying to do. Do you have any other suggestions for us to, um, this is an accident waiting to happen? Right. We, we agree. That's why the Congresswoman wrote the letter to the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission. She's concerned about uh, the danger that this will cause, not only to the residents, but to all of our properties as well. So I would love to speak to you afterwards and get the information on all that, and I'll bring it back to the Congresswoman to see what we can do to help you guys on that issue. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. And again, for, for all the members, Jonathan and the other representatives are here. We're, we're lucky that it's great that you guys come here. And if you have other personal things or your neighbors tell you something to ask Grace Meng's chief of staff something, just head over there during the meeting and ask. They're here for, oh. for us. So thank you. Also, if you want a copy of the letter that the Congresswoman wrote, I have a copy of the e-bike letter and a copy of the railroad letter as well. You can come see me after thank the meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we do have a representative next from Grace Meng, Tiana. Armstrong from Congressman Woman Grace Meng. Good evening, everybody. I'll keep mine very brief. I just have a few um, events that I want to speak of. Um, the first one is we're hosting another passport event after our last month's passport event was very successful. We will have that passport event on Sunday, March 19th at the Jackson Heights Post Office. I believe that is going to be from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, second is Congresswoman, Congresswoman Meng urges the post office to install a ramp at the main entrance of the Jackson Heights post office, as well as she called on the USPS to reduce the time mail is left in the relay boxes, add more safety locks, and increase transparency when mail is being stolen. I do want to uh, thank Mr. Glenn for the tip he gave me last meeting. That was very helpful. We gave it to the Congresswoman, and there's an investigation going forward right now. Um, lastly, we'll be having a mobile office hour with Make the Road on March 13th at 92-10 Roosevelt Avenue. And that will be all from the Congresswoman's office. So I have a question. Hold on. Yep. So we, we do have that big problem with mail being mm -hmm. stolen here. 
we think it's fr from the green boxes or something like that. And people are coming by saying, I think it's this. I think somebody who was fired now, now has the key to it. Yeah. What, I mean, and we get a letter from the post office that says, oh, your mail was taken between this date and that date. And sorry for the inconvenience. Contact your credit card companies and things like that. What, what else could be done? What could, so what can we do? if that happens to anyone in here, USPS has recently opened up a portal so that if you come to a Congress member's office, we could inquire on your behalf and there'll be an investigation on your specific um, mail theft or a relay box that's going on. They'll do an investigation. Well, what, is there something being done about the, the, the problem or, or is it, you, you, do you think it's one or two or three people? It's an isolated thing? It's... Honestly, I couldn't answer that tonight. It goes on throughout the entire, this has, I've heard it's been going on throughout the entire city. It's not just in this secluded on. area. Um, we have been working with the NYPD as well as the, as well as US, USPS on okay. this issue. All right, thank you. No worries. Thank you. Uh, John, John D'Angelo from State Senator Joseph Adabo's office. Thank you, thank you. Good evening. The, uh, the senator sends his regards from Albany. Uh, he'll be there today and tomorrow working on budget. Uh, basically, just some uh, quick events we have coming up. Oh, actually, I should start with this Saturday, <clears throat> the new district office is doing a grand opening. Um, the location, 8416 Jamaica Avenue in Woodhaven. <clears throat> Excuse me, from 10 to 2. Uh, I believe there'll be refreshments. So if anybody would like to stop by, we'd like to see you. Um, then on um, a Metro card van will be at that office on March 31st from 10 to 2. Uh, on uh, free tax prep with DCWP, which I'm not exactly what they are, but they'll be at the Middle Village office Wednesday, April 5th from 1 to 2 to help with your tax. It's a little late, but to help with tax preparation. Uh, and then heading into, I guess, early spring, uh, paper shredding clothing donations at Atlas Park. April 15th, 10 to 1. And then good old um, paper shredding and household good donations again in conjunction with Assemblywoman Rajkumar. Forest Park Bandshell, April 30th from 10 to 2. And uh, that's it. And I'll just leave you my office number. Any questions, anything, just give us a call. Thank Se you. 718 497 1630. Thank you and have a good evening. Thanks, John. Kevin Wisniewski from uh, Assemblyman Andrew Hevesy's office. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, again, Kevin Wisniewski with Assemblyman Hevesy's office. Uh, the Assemblyman is also up in Albany the next couple of days working on budget as well. Um, this will be his second term as the Children and Families Committee Chair, and last year some of our accomplishments included expanding child care subsidies to where 400,000 additional kids uh, became eligible for child care in New York, um, saving about an average of $20,000 a year per family. Um, so if, if you know anybody that may qualify for that program, they're more than welcome to reach out to our office, and we'd love to help them out. Thanks. Um, this year, in addition to push, pushing to expand access to child care, we're looking to make investments towards prevention services uh, with the goal of keeping families together and um, keeping children out of the foster care system. Um, beyond children and families' priorities, we're pushing for an additional $15 million for non-public school safety grants. Uh, we're working to fully fund the Asian American and Pacific Islander equity budget, and then we're fighting for a number of initiatives on behalf of local organizations, uh, including Queens Community House, uh, Common Point Queens, and the Queens Chamber of Commerce. Um, and then finally, as it's warming up, we're planning to reconvene our local community cleanup series. Um, last year, these were held throughout Middle Village, Ridgewood, Rego Park, Forest Hills, and Maspeth. And we had over 100 volunteers come out for the events, and 30 students claimed service credit hours. Um, our first date, we don't have a location set, but we're looking for April 15th, uh, so we will keep the board apprised. Um, and as always, if we can be helpful on any issue or you have legislative inquiries for us, we can be reached at 718-263-5595. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? 
Again, thank you very much. Yeah, I think yep. we have. Yeah, I we okay because I I know we've done Ridgewood, Mass, Beth, Middle Village, Forest Hill. I'll I'll talk to the assemblyman about getting uh, Glendale on there, and we'll we'll let the board know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Jolly Patel, Stephen Raga's office, assemblyman. Hello everyone, um, I'm from Assembly Member Stephen Raga's office, I'm the Director of Community Relations. Um, the, the member is currently in Albany, so he could not attend today. Um, I just have two program reminders and an event that we have coming up. Um, if you haven't already, make sure that you um, submit your senior citizen homeowner's exemption or disabled homeowner's exemption by March 15th. And if that is not something that um, is a priority, you can stop by our office so we could help you with the application. We're located at 5519 69th Street in Massapeth, New York. And our um, office number is 718-651-3185, so you can call um, in advance if you would like to let us know. Um, secondly, we're having another info session with Citizens Community, Citizens Committee, I'm sorry, um, for the micro grants for small businesses. So if you think you may be eligible, make sure to call our office um, to see if you can um, receive more information through the info session. Um, lastly, we're having a Women's International or International Women's Month um, Recognition Awards on March 25th, Saturday from 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. Um, so we invite you all to come. At, it's going to be at the Elmhurst Public Library. Oh, okay. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Melissa De Lobos, representing, representing uh, Assemblyman Juan Ardilla. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Melissa Villalobos, representing Assembly Member Juan Ardilla. He's actually in session right now upstate, so he sends his regards. Um, so I'm just here to pretty much give you some updates from our office. Um, in Albany, the Assembly Member introduced Bill A4862. This bill aims to amplify the distribution of public safety notifications for employers. The bill as of this past week has also passed the Labor Committee. Uh, I am not the point of person for legislation, but I could give you the contact information for the one who is, who is Christian Amez. Um, he's our legislative director. In the district, our office has launched a clothing drive to support new New Yorkers. Uh, many families arriving in this district, they have no shoes, no jackets, you know, winter in New York. Um, and we have two drop-off sites located here in CB5 which is uh, Topos and the YMCA in Ridgewood. Um, Assemblyman uh, Juan Ardilla also toured Ridgewood and visited small businesses, sharing information about small business support and talking in concerns of providing COVID-19 kits and all that. So we have many plans in the work here in Albany and also in the district. So please let me know if you have any questions. You could contact our office at 718-784 3194 again 718 784 3194 we are located in 4510 Skillman Avenue right. in Sunnyside thank you thank you <laughs> representing assemblywoman Jennifer Rajkumar Viola Az Azupe thank you I think he has the hardest job tonight I'm just kidding <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Viola. I'm Chief of Staff for New York State Assemblywoman Jennifer Rajkumar. I think everyone got the hint. All the legislators are up in Albany. It's budget season, so that's exciting. Um, so yeah, the Assemblywoman is up in Albany. Currently, this, the Assembly and the Senate are putting together their um, budget. Hopefully, it will be ready by April 1st. We'll see how that goes. Um, and next thing, so just I want to mention a couple of legislative initiatives that the Assemblywoman introduced this session. Um, a very important bill is um, regarding stillbirth. There are, a couple, there are many women that um, when um, they're pregnant, they go throughout the whole pregnancy, 
and then they have a stillborn baby. Unfortunately, they're currently exempt from the law of receiving paid um, leave. Um, there are about a thousand women in all of our state, so it's not going to be um, a huge chunk of money that's going to come out. But this bill will grant them to um, have paid um, paid uh, paid time leave. Um, this would uh, again, a lot of women don't receive this um, paid time leave, and even their body physically cannot heal by the time that they have to go back. Um, also, a couple of other bills. We have another bill in the works to authorize um, certain local agencies to use surveillance cameras to combat illegal dumping. I think everyone here knows how important that is, and we've seen at every corner in our district. Illegal dumping has become a really big issue, so this bill would um, add an extra surveillance to, to those illegal dumpings. Um, another very important bill is to require certain waste transportation by rail to be covered. So there's a lot of waste that's being transported, especially here in our district, that um, it's not required to be covered. And that smell, you can hear it from, you can smell it from every, every, every corner. Um, so this bill would require those, um, that waste to be covered with a certain material that the smell would then not um, come out. Um, also, the assemblyman is working with the mayor on a lot of public safety initiatives. Um, so if you guys have any input on that, feel free to reach out to our office. If you have any complaints, again, we would be more than happy to hear um, that. Um, another just a reminder, we're working with Senator Dabo on our um, annual paper shredding event on May 7th. And um, the following Sunday, May 14th, it's the e-waste event. And lastly, thank you everyone, and happy International Women's Day. Thank Any you. questions? Or? Oh, no questions. This is nice. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And the last thing on the chairman's report, I, I hope everybody either reapplied or knows that they didn't have to apply this year for the community board next year. Everybody got, everybody cool with that? Good. Okay. Now I'm going to have Gary give his report. Uh, district manager report. Gary Giordano. I, I don't know all the details, but there was a big fire today, um, Aubrey Avenue and uh, at Metro, or Metro at Aubrey, Aubrey. Kathy, was it the massage therapy place? No, it was the auto parts place, and two firefighters were injured and sent to the hospital. Two firefighters were injured and sent, sent to the hospital. So uh, we need as little as that as possible. I don't know what the cause of the fire was at this stage of the game. Yeah, and that's usually under investigation by the fire marshals. Uh, there was a power outage in portion of Middle Village last night. I think between 69th place and 75th place between Metro and Juniper Boulevard South. Um, I believe uh, frayed wires were the cause of the, the power outage. Um, the power was restored this morning. So uh, that's better than it, than it could have been, but still, what's the cause of those wires getting frayed? Uh, you're going to get a report tonight from our new uh, or recently established uh, Liquor License and Cannabis Committee. Mary Ann Latanzio is going to give that. And Mary Ann, maybe you could clarify for me. You asked me to mention with regard to um, the Maspeth Builder Block. Yes, uh, Maspeth Ted, could you please? All right. Uh, Maspeth has two new NCOs, and they're going to have a meet and greet and a build a block on Thursday, March 16th at 7 o'clock at Martha Luther High School. So I encourage everyone to come meet them and ask your questions and voice your concerns. Okay. Suck the seat, Charlie. <laughs> and Eric's going to, Eric Buckowitz is going to give the Transportation Committee report. But if any of you have any roadways that you know of, that need to be resurfaced, please email or call the board office. That's not something I want to go back and forth on uh, today. But I will tell you that we have been requesting Myrtle Avenue in Glendale to be resurfaced between Fresh Pond and uh, Cooper for several years now. And we've been hampered by first a uh, 
a catch basin project, a complex catch basin project at Cypress Hill Street in Myrtle, and now the gas company's been there for the better part of two years. So we're having a hard time getting Myrtle resurfaced, and that would really have to be done at night. And the other one that um, I've been pushing for, which is really bad if you're on it, Fresh Pond Road between Metro and Flushing Avenues. If you are driving Fresh Pond Road going northbound, go really slow because between Metropolitan Avenue and Reef Park, which is 59 Drive, that roadway is not a place where you should be driving much more than 10 miles per hour. Uh, that was scheduled to be resurfaced last autumn. It was postponed, and it needs to get done. So I sent another letter to DOT recently trying to push that. And I'm trying for Seneca Avenue between DeKalb and as far as we can get to Myrtle. So if any of you have requests uh, for roadways that need work, please email or call the board office. Oh, one other thing. Um, through the borough president, I learned that uh, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation is going to, uh, or has already started, to do air monitoring in portions of the city of New York. And in our area, it's a portion of Ridgewood, it's a portion of, I haven't gotten the map yet, a portion of Glendale and a portion of Maspeth. So I think the Ridgewood and Glendale portions are close to the freight rail line, and I think that's the reason that those wonderful ladies, Mary Parison and Mary Arnold from Cures, pushed that. John and I are both members of the Cures Board of Directors, just to let you know all that. And um, they're going to be riding around with air monitor, with air monitors, going up and down streets in a designated area. In Maspeth, I think it's the industrial area from what I saw, where you have a lot of truck traffic and, and all of that. A clarification on what uh, Vijola from Senator Rajkumar's office said. Uh, Senator Rajkumar has been good enough to pick up on what those, uh, the board from Cures has asked, and that is construction and demolition debris transported by rail is at best, in most cases, only being covered by um, mesh. And when you have gypsum and whatever else is in there, in my opinion, it's not so much of a stench issue unless the stuff gets wet, it's um, particulate matter that people would be breathing in that they wouldn't even realize because of the operation of the railroad with um, those hardly covered uh, construction and demolition debris cars. So what we really need for them to do is to containerize that or put much stronger tight-fitting lids on the top there, and that's been balked because of money previously, but uh, my thought process is, aren't people's lungs and health a little more important than the money it would cost to properly cover that? Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, we're gonna go into community reports right now. Mary Ann, you, you have a report for the liquor license and we're calling it Cannabis Committee. Good, good evening. The Liquid License and the Cannabis Committee met on Monday, March 6, 2023, 7 p.m. via Zoom. We discussed the licensing process, and Gary Giordano stated a liquor, wine, and beer and cider applicant for on-premise alcohol consumption license must notify the community board at least 30 days prior to them applying for the State Liquor Authority. He states cooperation between the 104th Precinct and CB5 helped determine problem locations, and there are very few in our area. We went into cannabis licensing. Gary G Giordano, District Manager of CB5, wrote a letter to the New York State Office of Cannabis Management on February 10, 2023, commenting on the proposed cannabis regulations. One of his comments was at least 60 days are necessary after notification for community boards to submit comments and recommendations regarding the applications. The Office of Cannabis Management proposes that there be only a 30-day notice given. The committee disagrees with the 30-day notice. This committee discussed stores and other locations where the cannabis is being sold without a license. 
The discussion of fines and confiscation was brought up and some members thought some were confiscated, but no fines were issued. Gary Giordano stated to his knowledge only three locations in New York City are licensed to sell cannabis. Cannabis location regulations include 500 feet from the school grounds, 200 feet from the house of worship, 2,000 foot radius dependent on populations of another licensed establishment. There is a concern of this committee of the numerous establishments selling cannabis with no license. This committee recommends that all establishments selling cannabis without a license should be shut down in fines and will bring this in front of the full board for a vote. This committee also recommends that the, that the community board be given 60 day notice instead of a 30 day notice and this should be also be brought in front of the board for a full vote. Any questions? So what's the, if they're saying they want, they want to give 30 days and we're saying 60. What, right, we're saying 60. Because in 30 what, days we're not, we're not even having a board meeting within 30 days to actually vote on it and, and get enough time. So, is the, the, does the committee think that there should be only a certain number of cannabis places? And, and, and what are they? And I the committee thinks that, that the ones that are selling should be legal, should have a license and sell it legally. Okay. So are you going to identify? Are you thinking the committee should be identifying these places and turning them into whoever? To the sheriff's office? I did the sheriff's to office. Us. Instead I mean, of, to, to Gary. Well, to, uh, and let Gary, you know, let, let the office do it. There's so many. That, right now, there's none in our area that are licensed. Yeah. So yeah. all of them that are selling it that are illegal. So the ones we know about, we could bring in front of, of to send to the community board, but we don't know all of them. Uh, Gary? I mean, would you be? No, I'll, I'll, I'll call on. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you, does it, maybe the next time you guys meet, think about whether it should be your, and the land use committee sometimes has been asked, you should identify houses that have been, that are, are non-compliant and turn them in. That's not really our, our job. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that if you're saying shut all of them down, that's not going to happen. They can't, they're not, not it's saying not happening around the, well, if they're illegal. Right, they, if they're illegal, they shouldn't be running according so to the So maybe you should identify as many as you can um, and then and turn them in and then at least we have a case. Say, hey, we're giving you these places, you know, maybe shut them down. But okay, I'll go, go mm -hmm. ahead, Gary. Marianne, do me a favor. You have a specific resolution, so read the resolution if oh, you have it. Okay. Right? Um, because it's a little bit deeper than it gives reasoning why one might want to shut these locations down. Right? You do have the resolution. Okay. Um, with the um, with the with the like, you're talking about with the robberies and. Uh, no, but do you have the resolution. You you have a resolution for us. So, the, so you, the, the committee met, and right. the committee comes up with a recommendation right. for a resolution that you'd like us to vote on, yes? Or, or do you want to get comments tonight, go back to your next meeting, and then formulate a resolution? Because, you know, that's the way a lot of times things are done. You okay. talk about it now, and then we maybe there back. are questions here about how to do it. And I, I get it. It was your first meeting. Yes. Go. <laughs> okay. And it, you know, it deserves some lively discussion. I would like to hear Mary Ann's draft resolution as it stands right now. Okay. There are too many business locations where cannabis is being sold without a license in New York City. Currently only three licenses have been issued for legal cannabis sales in our city. More needs to be done to reduce the problem of these illegal cannabis sales considering that cannabis being sold illegally, which includes that which can be smoked and cannabis that is in candy or other consumable products can cause illness when an unregulated and untested product is being sold and consumed. The stores where cannabis is being sold illegally are a significant crime target where the store can certainly be targeted by criminals who know that the store has a significant amount of cash and cannabis product on hand. Cannabis sales are overwhelmingly cash sales. Store owners are very unlikely to accept debit or credit card payments for cannabis when cannabis is not legal on a national level. We surely recommend the that more be done by the mayor, the police department, and other agencies in the cooperation to have store owners and others selling cannabis illegally adequately fined and that the cannabis product be confiscated. The store should be closed by agencies of the city of New York and the state of New York if compliance with the law is not met if the modest time period to comply. Okay. Go ahead. My, my suggestion, are there any of these locations in 
CB5? Yes. <laughs> then I would ask you to modify your resolution asking that the locations in Board 5 be closed down by what agency? Sheriff's uh, Department. Right. Sheriff's, Sheriff's Department. Department, I think, does. The Sheriff's Department with assistance of necessary by the 104th Precinct. I don't know if the 104th, I know the Sheriff's Department's handling the, the... Well, add them on just in case. Okay. And that would be an amended resolution to what you've got there. Let's worry about Board 5. Let's not take on the entire city. No, 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 we're, we're talking about Board 5. No, that's not, that wasn't the resolution, okay. though. So, okay. So you're going to, you're going to, we're going to, okay. You'll amend that to we'll friendly amend amendment resolution. to Board 5. Go. So I'd like to have a vote on that. We're going to have a little more discussion. All right. Hello? Okay. Um, so this is a, like a, a chicken and the egg scenario, right? Um, the reason why there's so many illegal shops, the reason why there's so many illegal shops is because there is so much demand. So if you shut them all down, you're going to create a whole new black market slash criminal activity by shutting down what are, yes, suspect, you know, suspect places, but you're going to create like more crime by getting rid of them. My second point is there was so much attention paid to who was going to be running these stores, but no attention paid to actually where they were going. And right now the only stores are in Walter, wealthy Walter, white. Walter, please. Are, are only in wealthy white college neighborhoods, basically. So you have this initiative to have you know, people who have been prosecuted through the system for illegal weed, and they're the farthest place from where those people actually live. So you're creating basically a black market if you get rid of them. I understand the sentiment that these are illegal, and some of them probably have suspect you know, product or whatever, but where is that, what is gonna fill that gap if you do get rid of them all? And number two, when are they coming to anywhere outside of Manhattan is the second part because if you're gonna get rid of them, you're gonna just create a whole bunch of demand and everyone's just gonna go back to their illegal dealers, their delivery services, all the places they were getting them two years ago. And that's the final question of this is like, it's been four years now since they passed it in the, in the state Senate and like we're still, like this is the slowest rollout. So again, to like criminalize people for something that is now legal for four years and they can't get it, I, I understand the sentiment. There needs to be like a, a sort of a transfer or whatever you call it, like to get to that next that next step. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Sorry. Okay. You've spoken already. I'll get back to you. Go ahead, Eric. If we were having this conversation regarding liquor licenses, we wouldn't even get this far. The places would be shut down like that. The whole point of legalizing this was so there's a regulatory framework to the cannabis. It's sale, it's, it's uh, use, and those laws aren't being applied like we would with liquor. With liquor, there's strict laws, use in public, s selling it, licenses to sell, we need to apply that equally to both cannabis and liquor. And I think the question we all have to ask each other here, if, if these were stores selling liquor unlicensed, what would we do? Would we be immediately making a recommendation to the 104, the sheriff's department, the liquor license authorities of the state, of the city, to shut these places down immediately? And I think the answer to that is yes, we would. And if that's the case, we should take that same course of action with cannabis. Go. Hand that, hand that. Yeah, yeah, just two quick things. First, the amendment should be changed because there is absolutely no credit card sales of marijuana. It's not federally legal. You can't use a credit card at all to buy pot. So, and that's one of the problems that there's so much um, thievery going on because everybody knows it's all cash sales. And the second thing is, uh, selling unregulated marijuana is the equivalent, like uh, uh, Eric was saying, of selling moonshine. You have no idea what's in it. I mean, I read that fentanyl it could be in marijuana, and, you know, it's very dangerous. That's one of the reasons oh. we were so strong with that. The, the, I ask that the committee recommendation be amended to only reflect the issue within Community Board 5. Only Board 5. Period. Yep. 
Um, Diego Clary. Uh, I think it bears saying that uh, while the topic of controlled substances um, is a sensitive subject and we should all be uh, uh, trying to observe the laws uh, to conflate alcohol uh, with cannabis is a bit of a stretch considering the levels of abuse of one and the risks of one compared to the other. None of that is to endorse uh, the illegal sale of anything or underage people consuming it, but we should sort of keep our feet on the ground and make sure that we're not conflating alcohol, which is a significantly more destructive force in our communities than cannabis has been for 100 years in this country. So th this is exactly why we started this committee, because there was going to be some lively debate, and it's good to have this lively debate, and not everybody's going to agree on this, Marianne. So it's, it, this, is, this is good. So it's up to you whether you want to, I'll get back to you, I'll get to you, whether you want to take this back to mi committee and talk about it, or you think you've, we've heard enough here, mm -hmm. and you want to take it to a vote. Yes, Kathy. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, I really think that this has to go back to committee. There's enough discussion. Uh, you have enough to talk about. And I think you have to focus on, I mean, I understand the point that this has taken years to roll out. None of us were around when they rolled out the liquor licenses. It took forever. Um, but I think part of the resolution needs to be to encourage uh, the authorities to get this on board, to get this moving along. And I don't know whether it actually belongs under the state liquor authorities. No, it's not. Though. What? No, it's not. Well, right now, um, we've clumped it up with liquor, and maybe it should really be completely separate. A separate committee? Yeah. I don't know. But I think you do have to go back and rework some sort of uh, compromise with the resolution. We'll go back and work well, on just, it. Yeah, just go back, just so that you know, there are something like seven steps that these legal cannabis places have to go. They, they tax the growers, then they tax the wholesale delivery to the, to the place, then they tax those other drivers and, and ship. There's just so many things that they have that you know, that the state can get taxes from, which is what they're doing with the legal. But they are, it is quite slow. It's like a snail the way it's coming out. Yeah. One, Fred back there and then you. Okay, the sale of illegal um, cannabis uh, is, is a big problem. It's got to be regulated. If that's the law, we're going to have it. We have it all over the place. Um, it is very dangerous having the sale of illegal drugs. The edibles are very, very strong. Um, you can overdose on that stuff. Kids overdose on it. Um, I have plenty of articles on children eating it in the home and animals eating it. It's a big, big problem. Uh, you go to Maine, some of you know hunting, and um, the, the domestic animals are eating this stuff around the house and in the front yard and they're turning up in vets every day. Oh, yeah. Animals are dying, it's a big, big problem. It needs to be regulated, if it's gonna have it, okay. Now it's everywhere. You walk, can't walk down the street without smelling it. Now if there are that many people smoking it, there's a lot of people eating it too. And this stuff is really, really strong. I've seen it in use. People's head hit the table like that, you know, from, from an, an, one edible. Mm -hmm. So this is serious stuff. Uh, it's very strong, um, you know, there's a lot of people who drink alcohol and are fine. Maybe a lot of people can take cannabis and be fine, but a lot of people, you know, it's very, very strong. So I think you need to shut down the illegals as quickly as you can. Um, and we're going to be living with it, you know, regulated too, and it's going to be a difficult situation. But I yep. agree with the motion. Getting, um, if, if there is any sort of timeline regarding like the outer boroughs, I know Brooklyn has a lawsuit, so they're not gonna get one anytime soon. So if there's, a, you know, along with your resolution to uh, looking into the crackdown, if you could also look into um, when legal cannabis will be coming to the district and specifically CB5, that would be, that would also be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Yes, you're in the back. When we, uh, 
You got it. It's good. It's on. It worked. Uh, maybe what we can do is remember Marianne and us on the committee, we discussed about separating where we have what we want Gary, where it's 30 days that we can vote on for 60 days. Yes. Do that vote and then send the other back to committee about the other end of it, about the illegal uh, shops and stuff like that. You want to do that? Yep, that sounds good. Yep. Okay, so you want to bring that vote? So the, go ahead, make the resolution. 60 days, you'd like? Uh, the community board would like to have 60 day notice prior to the licensing of cannabis sale. Okay, Gary. Second? No, we don't have a second. There's one more question over here. Not on the committee report. Go ahead. No, no, just take the one on the stand. Mike's right oh, there. Oh, hey. Um, what are. Exactly what is the 60 days for? Like, just 60, 60 days, days. Is to review, is for the committee and the but community board. But is there board. a licensing process yet that we're even a part of for this? Like, how does it work? Like, is it, it, are we assuming it will be similar to the liquor license just by assumption? Marianne, or they, they let you know that it's thir <laughs> they're asking for 30 days. They're asking for 30 days. Where so who's they? Um, yeah, I'm just. So the Office of Can Cannabis Management is saying, st says that we want to give community boards 30 days to make a recommendation. 30 days is never enough because we not might not meet in that 30 days. The right, that I understand. Meet. So we're asking for something that's pretty simple, 60 days. They can wait. They know months in advance that they're going to they're gonna open up. So the we'll apply. basically, it's, so it's them who's... They're assuming they're going to run like the liquor yes. licensing Correct. board. Okay, okay. Correct. It's, is it's an application. 45 days not on the table at all? Could that possibly be more amenable to them Good if we point. bring them 45? Good point. Um, it's, you know, would you say, Kathy, it's, would you say, Marianne, it's not going to happen for a while, so the vote could wait? I mean, it's not, we're not going to get a legal dispensary in a while. I, I think it was that Gary had to get comment in in a certain amount of time, right? Gary, you, you, you had to get comment in. In 30 days? In February, you sent comment the in. comments were due by whatever date I made. And you made them already, right? I made some comments. And you, did you make the 30 day to 60 days? So right. this is movement. No, unless you want to board support. So he made the comment, he made the comment for, for 60 days already, right? sure. Can I say something? I think that Reasonably speaking, we're talking about all new territory here, okay? The Liquor Authority doesn't say to us, you better have your comments in by 30 days. Right? We'll find out when the Liquor Authority is going to hear that case. I think it's absolutely ridiculous for any municipality to get less than 60 days to review a matter like this. It's my own opinion. 30 days, which means just push it down your throat and... Who cares about your comments? That's the way I see it. And those recommendations that I made, or comments that I made, were because of the timeliness of the matter and because other community boards were discussing the issue. Mm -hmm. But for the community board to be told that, look, the Department of City Planning gives us right. 60 days right. to comment with regard to a rezoning application. Um, and that's a, a specific section of the community. Something like this, if not operated properly, could really cause havoc to a lot of the community. So to give the municipality, and the community board in this case is the municipality, less than 60 days to me is ludicrous. All right, so you want to keep to the 60 days? Okay, pull the roll. All right, Mr. Adhikari. Yes? Yes. Okay. Tony Benanti? Eric Buckowitz? Four. Rachel Karachi? Okay, what are we doing? 60 oh, days. 60 oh. days. Four. Four. 
Walter Clayton. Four. Pat Crowley. Four. Nick Cutanaro. Four. Derek Evers. Uh, just to clarify, liquor licenses, are 30 days? Liquor licenses, they do not have it. I said that. They do not have a specific time period in which we have to reply. And it's never been anything like 30 days. Dimitra Fikowski. Stephen Fiedler. Fred Haller. Four. Fred Hoffley. Paul Kersner. Mary Ann Latanzio. Four. Diego LeCleary. Four. Ed Latow. Four. Kathy Massey. Four. April Narsassian. Peggy O'Kane. Michael O'Kane. Don Passantino, Four. Mike Porcelli, was he here? He was here. here. <laughs> Melissa Rebecca, <laughs> Ken Rayberger, Ted Renz, Luis Rodriguez, Four. Lee Rottenberg, Four. Walter Sanchez, Four. Dennis Steffen, Catazina Sita, Gianel Tapa, Patrick Trinchesi, Michael Ian Von Drathen, Mariana Zero. Four. Did I get everybody? everybody? No, it's just priority. Four. Okay, thank you. And Marianne, thank you for taking such a challenging committee. It's 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 exciting and it's interesting and there's a lot of debate on it, which is good. We won't hate on you. Disagree. We can disagree at times. Very good. And Patrick, too. Uh, Transportation Committee. Eric. You want this? Is that the closest one? Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. The committee has been just discussing ongoing a few topics in part excessive rail noise in Glendale. Uh, I know we've been hearing about this from residents for a few months now, and the committee has been addressing it. Most recently, we have reached out to the president of uh, New York and Atlantic Railway, James Bonner. He's uh, informed us that he's available to attend our next committee meeting. Uh, so we expect him to be there, where we'll, we will be speaking with him about these concerns from the community, and hopefully find a resolution uh, that improves the quality of life for people in Glendale uh, and Ridgewood who are uh, currently having the ill effects of the excessive rail noise. So I will keep everyone updated on uh, how that goes at our next meeting. I encourage everyone to come to take part in that. Uh, as Gary mentioned, uh, roadway resurfaces is very important. Everyone here, everyone in the community are our eyes and ears in the community. If you see a rough road, potholes, what have you, please let the board office know. So that could be forwarded and those roads could be resurfaced. Regarding the bus network redesign, the committee is on this. Uh, regarding So Brooklyn uh, redesign is currently what is open for comment. And now there's two buses, the B13 and the B38, which is affecting Glendale and Ridgewood. On February 17th, the committee did send out a letter to the MTA expressing our concerns on the reduction of service to Glendale and Ridgewood. Um, so this is being addressed. The MTA has been put on notice and is aware of this, uh, how that uh, reduction of service will negatively impact people in the community. And we will follow up with them to make sure there's some type of resolution and keep everyone here updated on uh, how that goes. Additionally, we are putting in comment on certain stops. In particular, there's a proposed stop near the Ridge Ridgewood Reservoir. And we want to make sure that's done in a way that works best uh, in the community and we are putting in a proposal on how that stop could be implemented that minimizes any disruption in the traffic flow or what have you. Or regarding city bikes, we've received a number of comment from residents uh, on locations that they believe don't work out the best for the community. So I do encourage everyone, if you see a new city bike station location and it seems like it's in a troubling location, a location that doesn't really work the best to best serve the needs of the community, please let the board office know, call, email, so the committee could investigate it. 
Also, if you have another nearby location that you think would be a good alternate, uh, I find that uh, it works the best when we reach out to the DOT to say, this location isn't working, but down the block, here's an even better location. And the DOT tends to be, or at least seems to be, more receptive to moving it if we give them an affirmative, hey, you can move it a block, block and a half away, and it works much better here. So please do let the board office know if you see any of these stations which you think could be moved and it would work better for the community to have it in that different location. Uh, finally, regarding traffic and pedestrian safety, the committee every month addresses numerous traffic and pedestrian safety issues. I encourage everyone who likes to be a part of that to come down to our meetings, participate. We love to hear from members of the community. If you have a particular request regarding pedestrian or traffic safety, email or call the board office and let them know. That gives the committee plenty of time to look into it before the meeting, so we could, and then we could address it properly during our committee meetings. And uh, it, this is very important because it's, it's about traffic flow, it's about safety of pedestrians. A lot of times these are near schools, so it's, uh, kids are involved. So please do let us know if you spot any of these issues in the community and let the board office know. Our next meeting is on March 28th. That's at 7.30 p.m. at the community board five office. So that's the last Tuesday in March. I encourage everyone to attend and I hope to see many of you there. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Question. Eric, with regard to Citibank uh, bikes, do you think that you can get us from DOT the statistics on the usage of the, all the installations? So the installations are quite new, so I'm not sure if those statistics are out yet. So uh, after about three months, then? Yeah, we get those I think that's definitely something we would want and then follow up on what's, and then get movement, you know, that, right. that could inform our decisions on what we want to recommend regarding uh, relocations. Okay. Thank you. Great, thanks. Is everyone getting um, notification of, of, of the meetings, of your transportation meetings? John, are, are the, the meeting notifications being sent out to all the board members? They are? Okay, good. Yes? Uh, Eric, can you tell me about the ownership of the city bike on Catalpa Avenue uh, by St. Matthias on your radar? I went to Morsh's pork store the other day Three parking spots in front of, on that, on in front of his store are, are taken up with City Bike. He said, and he said there's this location about a block away. So I don't know if that one's on your radar, but three spots on that, and then there's a restaurant. There's two restaurants up on the corner, and you know, taking away three spots, and the hand. Yeah, well, how do you park and have a spot? And then, yes, and. The handicap accessible to walk between them is like anybody will trip on it. That's yeah. <laughs> just a handicap. It's got these little barrier things that you have to step over. Yeah. I hadn't been there in a while, like, and I saw this, and uh, he's, he's very upset in any case. That's a location we are aware of, and we actually s discussed it extensively at our last committee meeting, and we are going to be recommending to the DOT to move that station a block away, uh, which we, we find, even if it has to be on the street, a block away would be a much better location than blocking those stores, uh, which as you, you pointed out is very detrimental to those businesses and the community's ability to utilize those businesses. All right, Kathy, you have a report on uh, education? We have an upcoming meeting, an education committee meeting. Patty, what day is it, the meeting? It's not set yet. Oh, it's not set yet, we're trying to set a, a meeting date, and that will involve the Greater Ridgewood Youth Council and a report from Maspa Town Hall. But I do want to mention that the superintendent for District 24 is retiring um, this month. And uh, I'm going to ask Demetra, was there any update on that, do you, what the process is, and when we'll be getting someone? Yeah, Dr. Chan is uh, retiring March 17th. My understanding that her deputy at a community board, I'm at, out of the community superintendent's office, is going to assume the responsibility, but no definite has been made on that. The CEC has made a strong recommendation for her to be the enacting. So more to come on that. All right, anything on, on the homeless? We didn't get going on that yet? There's been some news on West Hab. Okay, it's all right. Paul, you have a report for sanitation. Yeah, the sanitation committee. The, 
The Sanitation Committee will be meeting in the near future. We're waiting for Gary to schedule a daytime meeting so that our district super can attend because he's brand new, about two weeks old now. And maybe we can schedule it within the next two weeks, Gary, I hope. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Health and Human Services, anything there? Anything on par parks? Barbara Toscano is ill, and she was supposed to make the report tonight. She'll make it next month. Okay. And Parks? Fiedler? Was he here? I heard his name. No. All right. Any committees that I missed? No. Okay. Then I'm going to ask for any old and or new business that you'd like to discuss tonight. Time is now 9.01. All right, then I'd like to make a motion to adjourn, Kathy Matt. Second. We're adjourned. Thank you for showing. <laughs>